In this special episode, I'm joined by scientist Thomas Zoeva and artist Bridget Kennedy to talk about creativity in art and science, the sorts of skills and emotions that are involved, and how they both find inspiration in their separate disciplines. One of the things that I'm quite interested in is understanding how creativity is used in science and in art as well. We tend to think of it as only really being the domain of artists to be creative. So, Tomash, do you have any thoughts on how you use creativity as a scientist? So my research discipline is material science or chemistry. In researching material science, you are creating new materials or improve their properties, like making them harder, tougher, or more durable. To achieve these research goals, you have to work creatively. Uh, by creatively working, I mean using the existing tools in a ways that uh, no one have, has ever used them. And I think glassmaking is actually a really great example for creativity because we are just simply mimicking what nature does. Vulcanic glasses actually occurs in nature. So when a vulcanic lava cools down rapidly, it forms a natural glass. It is called obsidian. Uh, when we are creating glasses, it's actually just mimicking what nature does. But the other example is when we are inspired by nature is uh, synthesis of diamonds. Inspired by nature, we can create crystals that occur in nature by making laboratory conditions, uh, for example, high temperature, high pressure. And by creating these conditions, it's actually possible to create new materials or improve their properties. So I think in research, in material science, the creative work is basically just work with the existing tools in, in a creative way and just think out of the box. I absolutely love what you said, Tomasz, about um, using existing tools in a way that they've never been used before. And I think I would add from a sort of fine art perspective, it's thinking about things in a different way. So an artist might bring two really kind of different things together and kind of go, okay, what happens when I bring religion, the ideas from religion into a relation with nuclear waste? What happens then? It's kind of looking at either looking at connections or relationships between things from a different perspective and bringing something new in or making new connections. I think because artists can kind of draw on so many different references that they can activate a subject matter from lots of different sort of perspectives and also be quite sort of personal about it. So bring your personal experience into that kind of conversation or that sort of process of connecting things. And then, I mean, that I suppose that's all about the kind of conceptual approach to things, so the sort of thinking and then, yeah, I would echo what you said about using tools and also using materials in a different way, or perhaps putting materials into a different context. Exactly. And uh, there are so many available tactics nowadays, for example, for sample preparation or, or analysis. And uh, I find it really fascinating in my research that I can use tools that have never been used before in my research that were really useful for other science projects. I think this is also something that... Uh, is a creative thinking and that helps uh, certain research to, to, to go forward and uh, find new things. Do you look outside of your kind of area for tools? Or is there a situation where you would make a completely new tool? Oh, oh definitely. When I, I'm doing my research, I uh, read a lot of science papers. They're not all related to nuclear waste, for example, because my research field is working with nuclear waste classes. They also read papers or other research about earth sciences, chemistry, physics, and it's really fascinating to see how people for different research fields think about certain materials. They, they really see things differently. So obviously they are using sometimes different tools that could be useful in my science also. When you're talking about the volcanic glass and, and talking about obsidian, one of the things that I've been really interested in is the use of obsidian black mirrors in Aztec culture, but also by mystics like John Dee for um, scrying, for looking to the future, for divination. When I sort of make connections like that, I get really excited. The whole time scale of nuclear waste is so huge. It, it's kind of beyond human. It's so difficult for us to kind of perceive or get a handle on. So this idea of this black glass 
being the material that is kind of capturing nuclear waste. But for other cultures, it's been a material that has been used to sort of try to understand the future or ask questions about the future. I just find that totally kind of mind blowing, actually, really exciting. I don't know if you've come across an object that um, British Nuclear Fuels made, I think as a kind of souvenir or memento to do with the uh, vitrification plants uh, that was built at Sellafield. And it's it's meant to represent the volume of nuclear waste that one person would produce if they were to use nuclear power for their whole lifetime. To me, it looks like a scrying mirror. To me, it just looks like the objects that John D was using to call spirits into being. There's several objects in the British Museum, one that's an Aztec obsidian sky mirror, one that's it's come from a different area. It's a clawed glass, which is more to do with landscape painting. But they share the same material properties. They are black, glass, shiny, round objects. Yeah, it's actually really interesting to see how how natural volcanic glass is obsidians and uh high level waste human made glasses look. I was just at a, a conference last year where they made a comparison and trying to draw conclusions how nuclear based glasses will behave on a geological time scale. So we can use these other really similar materials to draw conclusions about durability of nuclear waste glasses. That is, is the goal. So if you're putting waste deep underground, the idea is it should stay locked away there for hundreds of thousands of years. It does make sense in a way to look at geological examples that have been around for that sort of time scale to get an idea of what might happen. Yeah, exactly. It's interesting. You both talk about sort of gaining insight from drawing together disparate disciplines. It sounds like it's quite a common theme in the arts and in the sciences as well. Yeah, yeah. I was just just thinking to sort of add to the deep geological disposal concept. What I find interesting about that is there's a technical, mechanical kind of process, but you put humans into the mix and human humans are not predictable humans are unpredictable <laughs> i think that is actually one of the things that i find very interesting about this whole debate about putting this material into the ground and just leaving it and kind of trusting that people wouldn't interfere with it <laughs> because history has proved time and time again that that's not the case the pyramids being the classic sort of example yeah, no, it's a good point. It's one of those big questions, like, what will language look like in hundreds of thousands of years? Will people know not to go and dig in this area because we put something down there such a long time ago? Or will society be completely different and we'll be digging underground for some other reason that we've not thought of? Oh, it's another interesting way to think about it and um, something for other researchers to find inspiration to figure out, I think. So on the theme of inspiration, if you both do research, how do you approach it? How do you find inspiration? I think a PhD journey is a really good example for both as I'm doing my PhD research at the moment. I think in the beginning of the research, you gain inspiration mostly from the people's work. You need to read a lot of science papers to be familiar with your research discipline. So I think in the beginning, you, you have an idea based on other people's results. And then you're starting doing research. And uh, uh, during these experiments, there are always unexpected things that happen. So you find some new things. And that drives you to do additional experiments, uh, find something new. So I think in the beginning, you probably gain inspiration mostly from other people's research. But as time goes on and you become more familiar and more confident, then uh, you just simply find new ideas. You just gain inspiration from your own experiments. I would agree with that. I mean, I think artists maybe have a slight, I mean, not all artists do the same thing, but I tend to find myself doing this or... <laughs> I don't know whether I'm intending it or not. I gain a lot of inspiration by putting myself in a situation where I'm quite uncomfortable and I don't know anything. It goes back to this idea of like, why would an artist be looking at vitrified nuclear waste? You know, what has art got to do with that? It's not always an easy situation or a comfortable situation, but I think it's really important to put yourself in this situation where it challenges your preconceptions and it challenges the people that you're in that situation with. It challenges their possible preconceptions of, of you as an artist or as a scientist, actually, I think. But I think I agree. It's kind of seeking out the unexpected, which is sounds kind of counterintuitive. But I think you can create 
situations or environments that allow unexpected things to occur. I feel like as a scientist on the one hand, you don't want that to happen. (laughs) But at the same time, we don't know everything. So there will be unexpected things. As much as we like to control all the variables, we can't. I kind of thought when I was going to say that, that it may well be the opposite approach. But then, of course, you like you just said, Laura, you don't know. So you need to be at least kind of mentally prepared for it to not go exactly how you expect. For artists, it's like you set off on that path precisely because you don't know what's going to happen. The goal is you find it out during the journey. You may have some very open-ended questions, which is quite difficult at the beginning of a PhD to explain what you're trying to do because you don't want to lock it down straight away. You want things to kind of unfold in time and, uh, yeah, and develop and kind of stew. Otherwise, I think it's straying into sort of the realms of design rather than fine art. Yeah, I think you can also gain inspiration by talking to other people. I really like the brainstorming sessions when I talk to other researchers or, for example, my supervisors or at conferences. And when people are working from, from different disciplines on the same project, they have so many ideas and it helps to create something new and and. and move the research forward. I also gain a lot of inspiration from talking to other people, not necessarily from a research discipline. Even if I talk to family members about my research, they might have some ideas. So they don't need to fully understand everything. They're really keen on how. But I think talking to other people is also a a source of inspiration. Absolutely. I mean, one of my methods is I just go to the site of Sellafield and I hang out around there. (laughs) I walk around there and make little actions with a scrying mirror or with whatever tools I'm taking with me. And inevitably people, you know, go, well, what are you doing? Or you just sort of start chatting to people. And it's, yeah, it's really, really interesting because most people that you encounter there will have some kind of history with the site. So you could, yeah, you can kind of gain insights on quite a kind of casual basis with people just walking their dogs or sitting looking at the sea. I think I often find in science that talking to non-experts sometimes there's more insightful conversations because they think of questions that you've not even thought to ask because you've been in this community that all kind of working on the same thing and thinks in a similar way and someone says but why is that fundamental thing that you think is true? Why is that true? And then you sit there and think actually that's quite a good question and that probably is a good answer. I just not really thought about it. Exactly. And what I do always before presenting at conferences is I present it to a family member or a friend who is not in that uh, discipline. And they, if they understand it, that means I can explain my explain science correctly. And this is one of the, the, the main goals of uh, doing research is to make it available for everyone. We're not doing it just for our own small research group. We we want to make it uh, publicly available. And what I find interesting about what you both said is you both do research. You tend to think of it's only scientists that do research. But there's a lot of research in art as well. It's just a different process. Oh, yeah. And I mean, you know, I do know quite a lot about sort of the vitrification process and the radioactive substances. I couldn't just go into this thing like not knowing a fundamental kind of element of the scientific background of it and the historical background of it. I mean, Sellafield is such a complicated site in terms of how it's developed and potential for its future development as well. A great audience, I always think, for artists and maybe for scientists too, is children. You have children come into an exhibition and they just ask really difficult questions <laughs> and they're totally <laughs> uninhibited. So it's it, it's great. Get a group of sort of seven to eight year olds in your exhibition and you really have to be on your toes. Usually they're more excited about a research there than about years ago when I was just sitting in front of a microscope and showing other people like insects or, you know, just zooming in. Children were so excited about just, just seeing how we can look into small things. They were more, more excited than that, so it was really interesting to see. Do you also get excited about your own research, or are there other, any other emotions that sort of feature in your day when you're doing science? Yeah, definitely. The most typical emotion that I feel when doing research is excitement, because uh, I believe I'm creating something valuable. But also, I, I think research is sort of an emotional roller coaster. 
because you always uh, find unexpected issues in your journey. So it's basically a continuous problem solving uh, <laughs> thing, uh, doing research, but, but I really enjoy it. So that there are definitely negatives sometimes, frustration when say, things are not going the way how you want it, but at the end, you know, uh, you find a solution. You come up in an idea, and and it's it, it's a really great experience. Yeah, and no, I agree with that kind of roller coaster <laughs> feeling. Yeah, excitement, definitely for me. One emotion that's quite important is for me is is this vulnerability, which is a sort of weird thing, but I think it's quite important for me to kind of make myself vulnerable to a situation to kind of really dig into how I feel about something. On the other hand, I might actually feel kind of love for my research and kind of infatuation with it and, and fall in love with materials and be seduced by materials. Sometimes that's dangerous. Sometimes you're getting seduced by material and you're not seeing what it's actually doing and it's not doing what you hope it's doing, but you're just kind of like, oh, it's just so shiny or so soft or, you know, whatever it is. Yeah, and definitely it's curiosity that sort of is the main emotion that kind of drives you forward. Yeah, and I think it can affect the efficiency of the work. Also, for example, I'm working with simple glasses and also with glass composites when there are crystals in the glasses. I'm always so interested in these crystalline materials. For me, it looks more exciting having a glass with, you know, tiny crystals and just looking at the glass. I was so, so amazed by that. So I really focused on on the glass composite sample. I should have worked on the simple glasses as well. I mean, I was just so curious what goes on in the inside these glass composites when crystals start to form. And uh, it kind of affects how your research goes. But this is a good thing because if you're curious about the material, you put extra work into that research. So uh, I would say it is also a beneficial thing, but it affects your progress. Yeah, it's interesting that you were use the word efficient because <laughs> I don't think that really comes into my sort of thinking about my processes I mean lots of processes that I use are sort of vastly vastly time consuming and inefficient sometimes that's really important to the work it needs to have that like weight of time and attention put into it I think that's where in art sometimes the way something has been made is very important to the meaning that it's trying to convey. Sometimes things get made quickly and efficiently, but sometimes they need to be made in a really inefficient way. And you need the time to create something great, so you, you can't do it quickly. So you need to be precise, accurate. You need to think thoroughly, do the experiments well. So you, you cannot rush it. You have to spend your time on, on a certain project to create something great. And also just what you were saying about kind of getting seduced by these crystalline structures and there is this kind of drawing in and looking at something really detailed but then of course you need that time when you stand back and you look at the whole picture and you edit and you kind of go I love that but it's not doing what it should be doing you know that and that happens in in art as well and sometimes it's the really sort of slight quick things that you've done that are the most important things and the things that you've labored over you, you have to just kind of let go one of my biggest weaknesses is that i spend too much time on creating images or illustrations so i really want to you know present my research in a, in a nice way and I always find myself spending way more time on creating nice images illustrations than i should i think that's all part of being a scientist though especially if you've got a passion for your work and sharing your work with other people you find good ways of doing it, right? And you want to take the time to do that. And being a scientist is about more than just sitting in the lab and generating results. Yeah. As you show on it, it's about finding inspiration, communicating, all these other transferable skills. I do a lot of kind of very repetitive processes and things that, you know, take a lot of time. I value that time because it's time that I can think about stuff. I think I'm, I'm sort of engaged in a process that is related to my research, but it's that it's that kind of, I don't know, maybe you have to concentrate more when you're making these images, but I find when I'm doing something that is, takes quite a lot of time, my mind can kind of be semi-engaged. And that is actually when I get really good ideas. So I just, I, I wondered when you're going through this long, laborious process of making these images, maybe that's valuable time. 
Uh, for me, it's, it's really interesting. So my, my work approach changed over the years. So in normal working hours, I do the, the, the proper research, like writing down the results or doing experiments. And I actually make these nice uh, images or illustrations in my free time. For me, it's sort of a relaxation also. So I really enjoy it because it's visually appealing. I would say that's exactly the environment for inspiration to come and ideas to come. But something very interesting that you said about work and not working and not thinking that things are work. I have a weird relationship with the word work and what I do. <laughs> I think if you're passionate about what you're doing, it doesn't feel like you're working all the time. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I always feel that I'm an amateur and that I'm sort of finding my own way to do things and that I wouldn't necessarily kind of try to do something the right way or think that because I'd made something as an amateur that it was bad. I think there's, again, there's this interesting sort of debate between art and craft and skill. And this comes in to my teaching quite a lot where students want to know the right way to do something. And in my opinion, the right way to do something is your own individual way of doing it. Of course, there are, you know, there are certain tools that are dangerous to use in particular ways. <laughs> I make things by hand a lot, so it's kind of a, a slightly different approach. You talk about the use of power tools and how you could misuse them to unintentionally cause harm. Yeah, yeah, of course, there are certain things that you need to do for your own safety. But I think there's a massive scope and range of ways to sort of operate with tools or to make your own tools. Talking about what skills or, or abilities you need to do research. Obviously, you need to know the technical terms. You, you have to understand your discipline. Doing material science, you need to know about materials, preparation techniques or analyzing them. But I think it's more important to have these sort of soft skills like communication or the ability to learn, to adapt. Communication actually is a key to talking to other people, asking help. By discussing your research with other people, you can really gain ideas. It helps creativity determination to the willingness to, to, to put work into the research obviously but so being a scientist is about being emotional and being creative as well and those things also feature in art so there are an awful lot of parallels it sounds like <laughs>